welcome to our Bible study here at Bible Talk. Here, here we are in Jacksonville again. Yes. So, and as you can see, we're joined by Mark here in Jacksonville. We did the whole pilgrimage. All came up to Jacksonville yes, today to do some filming to do to do the Bible study and to visit. So, we're here. We're ready, and we're continuing on in the study that we started last week called the evidence of a redeemed life. And if you missed that, please, it's, it's here on the Bible Talk website. Make sure you go back and see it, because that kind of <laughs> sets the whole stage for, for what we're doing here. It's the introduction. And it, it, that's what it is. It's okay. the introduction, yes. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> and it is, the study is about examining ourselves to make sure that we are living the lifestyle that goes with new life in Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay? Mm -hmm. And um, last week we determined that we're going to do that by looking at the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Because the difference between a redeemed life and an unredeemed life is that you are either, and it is just cut and dry, you are either bound to do the deeds of the flesh, mm -hmm. which are in Galatians chapter 5, or you should be exhibiting the fruit of the Holy Spirit, but it's one or the other. It's not, no, not gray in area. Nothing in between. And there's no excuses that, that fall in between there. Mm -hmm. It's either the fruit of the Holy Spirit or the deeds of the flesh. That's it. Right? So that's where we're going to start. We're doing, we're going to do the deeds. We're going to look at the fruit of the Holy Spirit that should be the evidence in our life of God's work in our life. And we're going to start right at the very first one that you'll find in Galatians chapter 5, and that is love. Okay? The fruit of the Spirit is love. And that's a great place to start, because as Paul wrote to Timothy, the goal of our instruction is love. Okay? It's not to become Bible scholars. It's not to impress others with our Bible trivia knowledge. It is about growing in our love. Our love, first of all, for the Lord our God, and then that should should make us have love for others. And it's not even our love; it's His love. Well, that's what we're going to get into because yeah. that's that's what's important about yeah. love. All right. The other thing is, it's not without purpose because God is a God of purpose. God is a God of good order. That love is the first of those fruit of the Holy Spirit because that's a gateway to all the others. Without the fruit of love. You're never going to have the other fruit right. of the Holy Spirit active in your life, mm -hmm. okay? And you'll see that as we go along. And I, I had ended the study last week by saying, you know, how do you know what love is? And I mentioned uh, the 1955 hit song, Love is a Many Splendor yeah. Thing, yeah. by uh, uh, Sammy Fain and Paul Webster. Because that's kind of like, how does the world define love? Mm -hmm. That's about as close as you can get. It's a many splendor thing. Love is, or I can say, love is nice. Love is, is that a definition? Well, how do you define love then, all right? From all of the evidence around us, I mean, I'm certain that almost every single human being breathing thinks that he or she knows what love is. Everybody thinks they know what love is. Mm -hmm. But what they know, they've learned from songs, movies, television, books, plays, and they still generally know anything about true love. true love. From all of the evidence around us, it becomes clear that the one thing that the enemy, our adversary, Satan, the devil, that he wants people to believe and has done an overwhelmingly <clears throat> successful job of doing with all of that cultural blabbering is to convince us that love is all about feelings and emotion. Mm. Yes. Does that sound... Feelings, all oh, those. That's another song about love, right? Yes. It's all about feelings. Well, the fact is, feelings and emotion can play a part of love. But that's not where love starts. The source of true love is, and, and to know true love, as it's defined by God's word, it's, first of all, it's a choice. Okay? Mm -hmm. We think it's a feeling. You know, you, now, you know... I understand that in the world. Alice and I, what's, what's today? Today is the first yes, of a new year oh, as we right. record this, all right? Blessed New Year. And Alice and I have been married 
for 46 years, three months, and one week. I met Alice almost exactly, or, or I, I asked Alice to marry me on Christmas in 1966. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> That's a long time ago. Yes, it was. You're very cute for your age. Okay, no, it's not good. And I said yes. And yes, <laughs> believe it or not, she said yes. Yes, I did. But I met Alice at a party while I was still in the Navy, flying in the Navy. And the night that I met her, I went home after that party. I was only in, I'd been flying from overseas, and I'd flown into the United States and went to this party, and two days later flew out of the United States. I went home that night and told my mother that I had met the girl that I was going to marry. Love at first sight. Yes, it does happen. It happened so that it was intelligent because Alice didn't think she, you know, she didn't even like me. But that's another story. Is it a feeling? Well, there there needs to be feeling and emotion. Yes. Okay. But it starts with that choice. Okay. And the choice has to start with the choice you make about receiving love. Okay. The love of God. Because if you don't have the love of God, you'll never know true love. No. Right? You all know this verse, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, mm -hmm. so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. John 3, 16. So God does this amazing, it's not for without purpose, his grace is called amazing grace. Mm -hmm. The gift of his son Jesus Christ to do for us what we couldn't accomplish for ourselves. And that's his love, right? His love caused him to give that gift. The other thing is, so we receive that gift of love when we get saved. We're talking about the, the evidence of a redeemed life. That's the place where redemption starts. Whosoever believes in him, whosoever will, it's making that choice to receive that gift of love from God the Father, right? Mm -hmm. And then... And Paul writes in Romans chapter 5 of, of his letter to the Romans, he said, Hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Mm -hmm. So we receive this gift of love from God, His Son Jesus Christ, yes. when we accept that gift. And then upon accepting that, He pours His love into our hearts. So without having God's love, a person has no hope of being able to love as he or she should. should. God doesn't depend on us to operate in our own love. He's poured his love into our hearts. That's one of the reasons, by the way, why, why God says that we should not be unequally yoked in marriage. Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Uh, you know, Alice and I, a couple of years, a few years ago, before one of our trips, we were just buying a, a new little suitcase. And we'd gone into this luggage shop, and there were two young women working mm -hmm. there. And as we were browsing and looking, they were having a conversation. One of them was talking about how difficult it is to find a, a, a person, a mate, in this day and age. Right. Right. So I engaged her in conversation. And I said to her, one of the things you have to be looking for, it turned out she was a Christian, was that you have to be looking to find a man who loves God. Because if you don't find a man who loves God, he'll never know how to love you as he should. That's right. <clears throat> so it's true. not that he wouldn't want to. No. He you can't. Know how. He doesn't know how. Because you don't know what love is. Mm -hmm. You think it's all about feelings and emotions. And look at, into my eyes and tell me I'm not telling you the truth. Your feelings and emotions change day by oh, day. Fluctuate. They do. Yeah. Like That's the a waves fact. of the sea. So people whose love is dependent on feelings and emotions, their love fluctuates mm -hmm. like that. But the love of God is steadfast. The love he's poured into our hearts is steadfast. So worldly people, you know, Jesus, let me, Jesus spoke very, very clearly, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to be a, a theologian and have a doctorate in biblical theology to understand the words of Jesus Christ. He said, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even the sinners love those who love them. Right? Mm -hmm. So he's describing the world's love. The world, the world loves people that love them. Okay? Tit for tat here. That's right. Quid pro quo. So worldly people have love. 
But there is love, and then there is love. While God's love never fails, worldly love fails over and over and over. Yes. We have the evidence of that before our eyes. Yes. More than half the marriages in the United States, and now marriages are disappearing, it seems. Mm. But half of them fail. <clears throat> and that's probably the single biggest commitment you make to love. Right. When you stand, or I don't even know if you do this anymore, you know, when you stand at an altar and say, till death do his part. Well, now, to be honest, people would say, well, till the feeling goes away. Mm -hmm. You know, if, as long as if they were honest, if they were honest, they would say because that's what they're committing to. They're not committing to more than that. So the strongest bond that we should know in love is between, you know, in the world is between a man and a, and a, a woman. That commitment to that marriage, they're failing left and right. They're not going into the marriage with a commitment. But they don't have. What I'm saying is, they don't have the ability. To do that. Because they don't understand what true love is, mm -hmm. and their their love is based on feelings and emotions, mm -hmm. which change and change and change. Mm -hmm. And particularly, they change over time. Yes. You know, it's almost a joke <coughs> here in the Western world, you know, it talks about guys in their midlife crisis going out to find a, a younger wife. Mm -hmm. You know, it's that's a horror. Yes. And we've come to accept it and think it's it's funny or, you know, it's, it's pathetic. It's not funny. Not at all. Mm -mm. Okay. So the obvious difference is that, to, that you can see in the statement that Jesus made that I just read is the ability to love those who do not love you. That's the difference. Be, and this is the evidence of a redeemed life. In the world, the unredeemed, they can love those who love them. To a redeemed person, filled with the love of God, you can love those who Thank don't you. love you. You can love the unlovable. You can love the people that the world rejects, that even the church rejects all too often. This is what astounded people and upset people about Jesus Christ, the religious leaders. He loved the lepers. He loved the blind, the, the halt, the lame, the people that weren't even allowed inside the, into the temple grounds. The outcasts. The outcasts. He had, because his love goes to whosoever will, right? Consider this, in the perilous last days that Paul talks about in, in 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, he makes it clear that as the end grows close, a time that Jesus said in Matthew 24, men, most men's love would grow cold, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Matthew 24. Mm -hmm. But Paul says in the last days, love would paradoxically increase. How? How? Because he says, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God. Mm. Their love's going to increase. But it's a, what happens is it becomes more and more self-focused, more and more selfish. The world's love is typically selfish. That is it's, love. It's like an implosion of well, love. It, well, it is, but it's, yeah. that's it's turned the wrong way. Yes, because it's yeah. all about what you get. It's about self-gratification. God's love is a gateway to all of the fruit of the Holy Spirit, as I said, right? Mm -hmm. Without His love, all of our love, in all of its manifestations, will be about what we can get out of that relationship. Exactly. The generally unpreached gospel of our Western-centered culture here in the church is a simple proclamation that the Lord made. This is from Luke chapter 9, right? 23 to 25. And he was saying to them all, talking to his disciples, he was saying, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? Self-denial. Not self-gratification, not self-satisfaction. So God's love is not about what you can get, but about what you can give. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Right? Mm -hmm. Let me say this and think about this, right? God shows love. The Apostle John defines love 
and Paul explains love. God shows love. This is Romans 5 8. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ poured out all of his love for us while we hated him. Yeah. That shows his love, right? John defines love in 1 John 3.16. He says, we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Love is a, not just giving. Love is giving totally. That's how we know what love is, that he gave everything for us, and we ought to give everything for, for our brethren. That's, when you give your life, you're giving everything. So that's the definition Paul explains love in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. When he says love is patient, love is kind, and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But if there are gifts of prophecy, he says, they'll be done away with. If there are tongues, they'll, they'll cease. If there's knowledge, it will be done away. But love will be what remains. That's why the goal of our instruction is love. That's the last thing. Right? From what I said, you should understand, right? Mm -hmm. That the love that is the fruit of the Holy Spirit is not our own love, improved, cleaned up, made a little better. The love that is the fruit of the Holy Spirit is God's love in us. Now it's important that you get that. And it's important that you understand because otherwise you'll boast in your love. I mean, we have nothing to boast of. It says, if any man boasts, let him boast in the Lord. Right? Mm -hmm. The reason that we have the power to do these things is because God has given us his love. Remember what I read before, right? Hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. You have, you, you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. We're talking about the redeemed here, right? Yes. yes. You, you carry the very presence of God with you, and you carry the love of God within you. The vessel. We are the vessel. So what we're doing now because this is about self-examination. This whole study is about, okay, we want to see the, the evidence of God's redemption, God's work, God's salvi saving work in our own lives. Mm -hmm. Paul says it, and we talked about this last week, so go check it out. Let a man examine himself. Mm -hmm. So we have to <laughs> examine our love to see if it's God's love, the Spirit, or if it's just our love, the flesh, which even gets disguised and dressed up in religious robes a lot to look good to ourselves and to others. Yes. A lot of philanthropy in the world. You know, it looks great. Mm -hmm. My goodness, this person's given this, this person's given that. But at the end of the day, maybe it's done, you know, to be really callous, maybe it's just done for the tax break, okay? Or if it's, if it's not that, maybe it's just done because it makes you feel good about yourself. Okay. You know... Well, people are... I would say, I don't know if you'd say they were known by their works, and they would people would look at those works as their love. Well, absolutely. Absolutely. That, that is, and that's what we're trying to do, is find those things, right? Because remember, Paul said that true love does not seek its own. Right. So if it doesn't seek its own, it's not selfish. It's never looking about, okay, what do I get out of this? Even if it's only recognition. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. It doesn't seek its own. It's not ever concerned about what do I get for, for giving this love out. In Mark chapter 8, Jesus said this. <clears throat> Jesus summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross. All right? so, I, so I read that, right? That's about giving totally. It's not, it's not partial. You're not, if you're dead, you didn't get anything back from it. Okay? 
You give it because it is a God-like trait in your life. This is why it's a fruit of the Holy Spirit. We are to be imitators of God, beloved, as beloved children, walking in love. That's what it says in Ephesians 5. It's all about love. So we need to examine ourselves to see if our, the reasons for our actions what motivates us. are self-serving yeah. or selfless. Mm -hmm. And that, you know what? That's, that's a harsh examination. To really think about when you do something, are you looking for a reward? Alice heard something the other day. I, I'll get it wrong. I don't know where you saw this. Just a little thing about a, a young boy in a school and at, it must have been a Christian school, and he was given an award for being the most humble student in the class. He was, a, the mo he was very meek and modest. Very meek and modest. So, so they, they gave, gave him an award. Badge. They gave him a badge. They gave him a badge. The most yeah. humble. And the next day they took it away from him because he wore it. Mm. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I, I, I understand this. I, <laughs> I had a real problem with pride. I think we all have a problem with pride to some degree, but I had a real problem with pride before I got saved. And after I got saved, it was something that God dealt with me with, about, mm -hmm. and without pulling any punches. I mean, really, really dealt with me. And I got to the place where all of a sudden I recognized that God had done something in my life and changed me, but then I recognized I was becoming proud of my humility. Mm -hmm. Take that badge away. Take the badge <laughs> away. So, but we need to be honest with ourselves. And you want to know something? The Holy Spirit within you will bring to light those things that are even in the darkness of your, those little corners of yourself that you try and hide. You know what is, um, is very difficult too is there are times when you do something and you're, not, you, you're doing it because of God's love and then somebody will bring it to your attention and that's really terrible because then all of a sudden it's like your pride starts to well, yeah. get puffed up about that. And it's also dangerous because you can lose your reward for doing those things because you receive your reward in full here right, on earth. Right, yeah. That's Jesus said That's that. That's what he right? said. That's exactly right. So we need to examine ourselves to see, like I said, are we doing things for selfish reasons or are we being self-serving or are we being selfless? Mm -hmm. You can answer the question. You get together in the dark, in that place, in that quiet place where you go to pray, wherever it is, and that quiet place can be you know, in the midst of a, a, a noisy thing, if you've learned to just be in touch with the Holy Spirit. And if you have a willing heart, if you have a, prayers like David had prayers, you, create me a clean heart, cleanse my heart. If you have that prayer, unite my heart to fear thy name. If, you, if you're praying to God, he will show you those things. And not for condemnation, but for correction. He disciplines those whom he loves. Because you're being discipled. Disciplined, disciple. Same words. Mm -hmm. Because this is the process of God transforming us and bringing us from glory to glory, which is His promise in our lives. Part of the reason we, we need to be doing self-examination like this is so we're in that place. It's like an employee review. You know, you sit down with a boss and the boss tells you... You're doing a good job or you're not doing a good job? Well, he'll tell you both. Yeah. He'll so tell you what you're doing right to encourage you to build those things the strength in the things that you're doing right. And they'll tell you the things that you're doing wrong so that they can be corrected. Mm -hmm. Not to punish you, not to judge you. No. But this is what we should be doing. So we should be going before the Father. You know, we do these seminars uh, in, in that M.D. Solomon ministry that we have. And I say that the Bible is the employee handbook. Mm -hmm. Well, what I'm talking about is kind of like an employee review. Yeah. You, you sit down with the boss and say, Oh, Holy Spirit, how am I doing? And don't be shocked at the answers you no, get. <laughs> okay. You can do all of the right things for all of the wrong reasons. That's the truth, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So while, while you may take actions that impress men who look at outward appearance, well, Paul wouldn't be fooled. And I promise you the Holy Spirit wouldn't be fooled. Because think of the words of Paul. In 1 Corinthians 13, mm -hmm. he said, If I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. So Paul is saying that very thing that I'm saying right now. You could give all your possessions to feed the poor. 
You could surrender your body to be poor yes. and do it without love. It has to be the foundation of love because you want to know something? That's the foundation that, that is the foundation of your relationship with God. You only have that relationship with God the Father because he poured out his love into you. Right. And he gave his son Jesus Christ in an act of love that we would be the redeemed of the Lord. So God in us. God in us. And God is love. Ah, and God is love. Right? Exactly. That's what we're hard to say. Yeah. Go ahead, say it, Mark. <clears throat> God is love. Hallelujah. First, first John 4, 8. Yes. But that's how you can do it. So we have to get to the place where we, we really don't try and get any credit or seek credit. We do things because of our concern for others. We do things, we give to the poor because of our love for the poor. And that's not us working, that's God working That's God's love in us. In us. Okay. Yes. We, we would give our lives for the Lord, give my body to be burned, but you're not doing it to look like a spiritual hero. No. You're doing it because of the love of God and you're going to be faithful to Him. Yes. Because when we talk about love, remember first of all, that's the highest, the foremost command. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the Lord, the Lord is one. You shall love Him. All. All, all your everything. All. Right? Mm. So that's what, that has to be the foundation of all love in our lives. So, in the same way that Paul said that, right? The Lord who searches the heart. Yes. What does he search the heart for? To find his love. Ah. He, he's poured his love into your heart. So when he searches your heart, he's looking for that love, yeah. right? Is that what's moved? He also makes clear his position, right? Remember what I talked about? Paul said, well, I can do all this stuff. I can give all, everything I own yes. to feed the poor, but it doesn't profit me anything if I don't have love, if it's not his love. Okay, God spoke through the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 64, verse 6, and he said, all of our righteous deeds are as filthy rags. What we do on our own, they don't impress God. Yeah, not at all. It profits you nothing. But we're being trained by the world to do everything in a self-serving fashion. And this is, I'm going to say this, and if it sounds judgmental, hey, you know what? I'm standing here, there are three of us gathered in the name of Jesus Christ, and I know he is present. Amen. And I am not afraid or ashamed to say this in the presence of God. The church is doing a rotten job, by and large, of teaching this too. Amen. They're teaching so much about giving to get. It's about what you get. It's about what you get. Well, and what they do in the pulpits is to make them feel good. They're motivational speakers to make them feel good. To either to make them feel good, but I mean, ultimately... They're doing it to gain something. Right. Okay. Well, I, I, and I'm not going to get into that more than that. No. But you know what? It says, test the spirits for many false prophets are going abroad. We, we need to be doing this. We need to be a people who are testing, testing, examining ourselves and testing those prophets to see if they are truly bringing the, not just the Word of God, because the Word can be wrongly divided. That's yes. what Paul told Timothy. Mm -hmm. But they are preaching the whole counsel of God, as Paul said he was. All right? And that whole counsel is about dying to yourself, denying yourself, giving, giving, giving. Because that's the imitation of Jesus Christ. All right. So the, the, the word our is the key to understanding that harsh truth. Our, our good works are yes. filthy rags, yes. right? Our deeds need to be the fruit of his Holy Spirit. The result of his love within us. Mm. His work bringing him the glory. That's right. You know, Jesus said that in the Sermon on the Mount. Let people see your good works that they might glorify your Father in heaven. If you're getting the glory, God's a jealous God. He will not share the glory. So Paul goes on to say there in 1 Corinthians 13, he says that, that true love does not take into account a wrong suffered. That's right. Really. Well, it should never. We should never take into account a wrong suffered. And the reason is very simple and very, very logical. Psalm 119, verse 165, says that those who love thy law shall have great peace and nothing shall offend them. And I know I've shared this in other Bible studies with you, but it just bears repeating. A few years ago, I was in London, and I'd been teaching in a, in a, in a large 
group. And uh, afterwards, one of the women, the women of this uh, leader of this big prayer group for an African nation, came up to me and said that she had just come back from a conference, and one of the topics they covered was offense. You know, how you deal with people who offend you. How do you deal with these people who offend you? Because, you know what? People are getting offended very, very yeah, easily on the world. Yes. So she said, what, and she said to me, what should I do when people offend me? I said, easy, repent. And she looked at me and she said, well, wait a minute. I said, I said, when they offend me, what should I do? I said, I, I, said, I understood that quite clearly. I said, what you need to do is, if, is repent. Because if you take offense, you need to repent. Because it's an indication that you have not died to yourself. You can't say like Paul, I have died in my life as in Christ Jesus. Because dead people don't take offense. No. Nothing bothers them. Nothing bothers them. <laughs> it's over, it's done, it's gone. They're in a, they're, they're in a place... Uh, we won't go there. <laughs> we're talking about the redeemed. That's we're in a place right. where, hallelujah, it's all good. Hallelujah. So, think about these words of Jesus Christ. All from, all from the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, Do not resist an evil person. Whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. Then he goes on, I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. If you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. Then he says, For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, whoa, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. It's not good. No, that's, that's pretty serious stuff. Yikes. And again, it's something you don't hear a lot of teaching on. Mm. Well, we need to hear teaching about this. Because if we're looking for the evidence of a redeemed life in our own lives, this is what it comes down to. Like I said, love, the difference between the redeemed and the unredeemed is whether you love the people that are not lovable. Whether you can love your enemies or not. Whether you can, isn't that, that's the difference. Mm -hmm. The sinners love those who love them themselves, right. Right? right? But the saints can love those who love them or those who, or those who hate them. That's right. We have the power to do that. The world does not have the power. So you should never expect it from an unsaved person. Well, no, you, well, you, you, you shouldn't expect righteous behavior from no. unrighteous people. No. You shouldn't act the unredeemed to act as if they were redeemed, redeemed right. okay? But in an era where there's so much opposition to the true gospel and the true church, we have ample opportunity to practice those commands of Jesus. All from the Sermon on the Mount, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the picture of normal Christianity. Yet the evidence all too visible to the world, paints a very different picture. I'm just going to mention these names. Osama bin Laden, mm -hmm. Saddam Hussein, mm -hmm. let's just take Islam in general. Fidel uh, Castro. Well, or, well they, these are terrorists. What were, the, what were the Roman soldiers that drove nails through Jesus' hands and feet? They were an occupying force. They weren't nice guys. They, that ruled by force. When Jesus hung on that cross and prayed, Father, forgive them, did he, was he talking about them? Absolutely. He's taking them as everybody. As everybody. When it says, Peter writes and says that God, our Father, desires that none should perish. Was he talking about Osama bin Laden? Yes. Was he talking about Was he talking about Joseph Stalin? Was he talking about Adolf Hitler? None means none. Now it doesn't mean that they didn't perish, mm -hmm. but it was his desire, his love, that none should perish. And the deal is, while while there are people in the world who are evil, God has a plan, because you see, He has given the governments the sword to protect us and from evildoers and punish evildoers. That's not our ministry. We have a ministry of reconciliation. Our purpose should be to have a heart that cries out for the salvation of these people. We should be, but you won't do that if you don't love them. Hold them over all of them. Love your enemies, love those who persecute you. Of course, the enemies are not, not listen, they wouldn't be your enemies if they were nice people and treated you great. And they could be in your own household. 
They Look could at how be. many families have their, they're not speaking with sisters, brothers, cousins. The Hatfields and the McCoy, McCoys, yeah. yeah. There are those kind of feuds going I mean, on all over the right place. Take it right into your own little... But the deal <laughs> is, you see, when the church should have been heartbroken at the loss of people, and we should be, listen, we should be heartbroken at the death of anybody who has not accepted Jesus Christ. Yeah. I'm telling you the truth. But it doesn't happen because we don't know them. No. And it says in Proverbs that we're not to rejoice when our enemy falls. That's right. Well, did the church rejoice when these guys were captured and, and or killed? Yes, they did. Okay. Is it good that they were captured and killed? Well, it was absolutely good that their reign of terror was stopped. Yes. That's the job of the world, the That's government. Right. Our Check job from evil is doers. to bring the good news. Our job is to bring these unlovable people the love of God the Father expressed in Jesus Christ. That is the evidence of a redeemed life. That is the thing that we can do that the world simply cannot do. They don't have the power to love those people. Bring them and you would not have the power to love those people if it were not God's love inside of you. He doesn't expect it to be your love to, to do that. Mm -hmm. But he's given you his love so that you can do exactly that. So they have to be presented. They have to be given they have an to. opportunity, that and choice. You know what? If you think I'm wrong, show me in the word of God. Because the word of God is profitable for reproof, for, for, for correction. Sure. If I'm wrong, send me in the Word. I don't care about your opinions. I don't even care about my own opinions. I only care about the Word of God. And the fact that, you know, Alice and I were in Kenya. I was teaching in Kenya, East Africa this year, in the summer. And I was teaching all these pastors and bishops. And in the, in the eastern part of Kenya, around Mombasa, there on the sea, and in uh, uh, Nairobi, my goodness, they are encountering more and more Terrorists. problems with Islam, with radical Islamists. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I mean, two days after we flew out of Nairobi, that's when they had that attack on the mall where so many people, Christians, yeah. were, were tortured killed, and killed, tortured and killed. Mm -hmm. So I had one of the, a couple of one of the pastors from Mombasa, mm -hmm. and uh, I was teaching this class. But after the class, he came up to me. And we were talking about there's more and more incursion of radical Islam into the areas that he serves God in, mm -hmm. and he says, "What are we supposed to do?" And so what you're supposed to do is love them. Count, counter it with radical Christianity. Radical Christianity. And radical Christianity says, love your enemy. Pray for those who persecute you. Bless them. For this is the will of God. I mean, this is what God says. Look at the Sermon on the Mount and see if Jesus doesn't say, this is what makes you perfect. Mm -hmm. This is what makes you sons of your Father in heaven. When you love those people who hate you. When you presented that when we were in Belize to a group of pastors and bishops, the, um, the apostle of that whole group said that that concept of forgiving would, re would just revolutionize oh, the church. Oh, that was in, in Cameroon, West Africa. In Cameroon. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, did mm -hmm. I say Belize? Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. I didn't mean Belize. <coughs> No, but that, I think I probably preached that kind of message in they Belize, believe, too. Yeah, yes, but in yeah. Africa, they really yes, needed to they do said, it. Yes, yeah, yeah. they said because that would revolutionize In it. that area, there was like a culture of revenge. Yeah, and, yeah. But that's what Jesus said. That is Christianity as presented to be normal by Jesus Christ in the Sermon on the Mount. And the world would see that as weakness. Well, oh, it, sure. yes. As extreme weakness. Yes, and then you don't yes. fight back. Yes. Right. So if you're, you're examining, but, yes. but this is the point. Examine yourselves. This is, we're looking for the evidence of a redeemed life. An unredeemed life does not have the power to love those people. Doesn't have the power to do that. Doesn't have the ability to do that. But a redeemed life has the power to go out and face the largest enemy and bring the love to them now. Yes. That's the ministry that we have in this day and age, is a ministry of reconciliation. To go and say to those people, no matter what they think, they it doesn't matter. Because it is only the Word of God that has the power to change them. Mm -hmm. And to say to them, Jesus Christ died on a cross for you. And I'm going to tell you something. It may not, because it's for whosoever will receive it. That's right. Osama bin Laden may not have received it, but Jesus Christ died on a cross for him. Saddam Hussein, Jesus Christ died on a cross for him. He may not receive it, 
You know, there are plenty of people in our Western world, nice looking people, dressed nice, earning lots of money, doing this and doing that. But, they not but if they don't it. receive it, they're in the same place and they're going to wind up in the same place as Joseph Stalin, as Adolf Hitler, as Osama bin Laden. You're going to wind up in the same place unless you receive and walk in the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the power of God, the love of God. They have to have the opportunity to choose. Is love the evidence of a redeemed life? Jesus Christ said, by this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Amen. That is the evidence of a redeemed life, is that love. Nothing has more ability to bring us to the fullness of the visible and victorious life that Jesus desires for us. The, the life that he spoke of when he said, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. When you walk in the fullness of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, when you walk in the love of God, when that becomes your desire to grow in the love, because remember, knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. We have to get to that place where love is what it's all about in our life. The love that Jesus taught about in the Sermon on the Mount. Not just loving the people that love you. Not just loving the people that are like them. And you want to know something? I said before, your emotions and feelings will change. When you start to pray for your enemies, yes. your feelings about your enemy will change. That's right. I promise you that. Yes. When you start to pray for your enemies, the emotions that rise up when they come to your mind will change. Because the Holy Spirit in you will make it Happen. Your feelings and emotions will follow the choices that you make right. or the choices you fail to make. I'm telling you the truth. If you reject the love of God, you'll never know how to love others. And if you don't know how to love others, you're going to face Jesus Christ and have to explain why. Ta-da. Ta love conquers all. Love conquers all and love never fails. Right. Lord, our victor evermore. evermore. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Me so, too. like I said, it's like a waterfall. It starts with love, and the next one is joy. Well, yeah, just when you have that love, the joy just bubbles up. Because if you don't have and walk in the love of God, you're going to be miserable. You're not going to have joy. You're going to have depression. Or you may have a flick of a spike of happiness here and a spike of happiness, but you're going to be miserable all your life mm -hmm. if you don't have that joy that only comes as a fruit of the Holy Spirit. And if you want to find out more about that, hallelujah, tune in, same time, same channel <laughs> next week, because we'll be back, and I pray that you are. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you. Thank you Jesus. We thank you for the love that you gave us. Mm -hmm. We thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus who did for us what we could never do for ourselves. We thank you that you poured your love into our hearts so that we have the power, the ability to love others as you love them. We thank you, Lord, for the fruit of the Holy Spirit bursting forth from our lives to do the things that we could never do in the flesh. We praise you and thank you for all of your good gifts in Jesus' precious name. Well, praise God. Before we leave you for this session, I know that Alice wants to tell you, Jesus loves you a lot. Hallelujah. Till next time, God bless you and goodbye.